the recording before I introduced you, Dr. Eshelbach. That's Dr. Eshelbach, okay. Redmond, Oregon. And tonight it looks like we're going to be doing orthopedic and pelvic trauma, which is an excellent topic. And I will be muting my microphone. Uh, and unless the internet goes out, I'll still be here. But uh, you guys enjoy the lecture. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, today, we're going to talk about orthopedic and pelvic trauma. Specifically, uh, we'll go over some of your requirements for education so that you understand. Uh, you'll have a list of things that you need to know and have to know. And then we'll talk about one of the biggest killers uh, in uh, trauma, which is pelvic trauma, because of the uh, unique aspect of the pelvis. And we'll talk a little bit about its uh, uh, innervation, its bones, and its fractures. And then we'll go over some cases where uh, people uh, did good, uh, bad, or indifferent with uh, handling of the pelvic trauma. So uh, first off, um, one of the most important skills that you will develop is uh, trying to identify a patient's problem and prioritizing uh, your care plan and uh, executing that plan so that you do exactly what it is that you need to do to get a patient from point A where you are to point B, which is a higher level of care. Uh, sometimes it takes uh, being a, a very good detective. Uh, trauma in and of itself is usually self-evident, but uh, medicine is sometimes a little bit more subtle and you have to be a uh, detective and ask the correct questions. Uh, when you are trying to get a field impression, you have to use an organized process, uh, but it has to be slightly flexible depending on your patient. Uh, you have to know when to expand your questioning and when to focus your questioning. Now, in medicine, medical patients tend to identify the problem by a chief complaint, shortness of breath, chest pain, uh, you know, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, all of these things. Uh, and you try and glean from their medical history what might be going on. Trauma patients, the history is a little bit less important. Uh, it's important to know if they're on blood thinners like warfarin, for example. But usually with trauma, uh, you look at it and you approach it. We'll go over what's called the primary survey and uh, you attack it from that aspect. And that's where you get a modified approach. Uh, you have to ask about the mechanism of injury. Uh, you know, was this uh, zero to 60 uh, into a telephone pole? Uh, forces that act on the body that can cause damage? Or uh, medically speaking, is that what is the nature of the illness, the general type of illness a patient might be experiencing? Uh, so uh, you approach it from two different aspects with trauma and medicine. Um, your primary assessment is where you form your general impression. Uh, it's uh, based on the initial presentation or their chief complaint. Uh, you make a conscious, objective, and systematic observation. And then you determine is this patient stable or unstable because stable is a certain pathway of treatment and unstable is another. Example, st uh, stable VTAC versus unstable VTAC. One you treat with medicine, one needs electricity. You know, is the patient sick or not sick? And that's something that you'll gain over time. Uh, a primary assessment, um, when you're working this, you have to form um, a general impression and then when you're talking about trauma, uh, you have to observe their level of consciousness. Uh, you have to decide whether spinal uh, motion restriction uh, is something that you need to do, uh, see collar, et cetera. Uh, priorities of care, which we will go over, and age and sex of the patient are also very important. Why? Because older patients tend to do poorly with trauma and female patients who might be pregnant. For example, you've got two patients on board. So all of these are important to get 
doing your general impression. Uh, rules of patient management. These are some pretty good basic uh, golden rules. Number one, if you're thinking about giving oxygen, then probably give it. Um, a notable exception would be uh, chest pain. If their oxygen saturation is greater than 94%, we don't generally give those folks oxygen anymore. We used to, but we don't. Uh, if you can't tell whether a patient is breathing adequately, then they probably aren't, uh, and they might need your assistance. Um, and if you're thinking of assisting a patient's breathing, you probably should be. And when a patient quits fighting, it doesn't mean that he's getting better. Uh, it could possibly mean that he or she are turning the corner and getting particularly worse. So when we talk about trauma in advanced trauma life support and still part of pre-hospital advanced life support, we talk about the primary survey. The primary survey is something that we do in a very systematic way, and we always come back to the primary survey anytime there's a change in condition of the patient. And in the first 10 seconds of taking care of a patient, you can get 60% uh, through the primary survey. Number one is airway, two, breathing, circulation, ABC. If a patient's talking to you, if they can answer you, and if their skin tone and color is good enough uh, that they're not pale or diaphoretic, most of that ABC is taken care of. Disability, of course, is their Glasgow Coma Scale. What's their GCS? Uh, do they uh, know where they are? The chair you're sitting on right now has a GCS of three, and the best uh, patient can give you is 15. Uh, we'll go over that in a few minutes. And this is the one right here, the expose. This is the one that catches paramedics the most. Uh, this is the one that in the ER, we're very, very brisk at doing. Uh, you guys bring somebody in uh, from a motor vehicle accident. Uh, maybe they're in full leathers and a helmet uh, and uh, boots uh, from a motorcycle accident. And the first thing the nurse does is open her trauma shears and goodbye leather jacket. And this is where uh, the E is where uh, paramedics tend to lose points or uh, make poor decisions. And we'll go over some case histories specifically uh, that show us that. Um, the E for uh, is also about environmental control. Um, if the patient's body temperature um, is the most important, you know, the colder they get, the more likely they're not going to clot well and the more likely they're going to have, head down a pathway of error. And uh, if it's comfortable for you, uh, then the patient is probably uncomfortable and cold. Uh, if you have warm fluids, those are always best. Uh, the room temperature, uh, it should always be warm, which that means if you're doing your job and working in an ambulance with a trauma patient, you should be sweating and the patient should be warm. Uh, this will help you with early control of hemorrhage. It's best to remove all clothes, whatever you can and whatever is practical. And um, you're going to cover that patient to prevent hypothermia. Uh, this is something that happens often. We often get a patient who's been exposed. You know, you're by the side of the highway, it's raining, it's cold. Uh, you're trying to take them out of a, uh, a wrecked car that no longer has a heating element that's working, and then you have to transfer them to a, a KED or a stretcher and put them in an ambulance that's probably had the doors open for 20 minutes or so. And this is one where we start to lose 
uh, control of the patient pretty early on. Adjuncts to the primary survey are things that you can do uh, that help us make determinations. Now, in the emergency department, this slide is designed for the emergency department, but um, a lot of these things you can do. And your primary survey is continually moving. So what I'm trying to say here is if you've got ABC and you determine that somebody's airway is compromised and they're not breathing well, you're going to intubate, correct? So you intubate and then you're gonna to wanna to know what pulse ox is and then you're gonna move on to C, D and E. If you get to C, they've got no pulse, obviously, you've got to start some form of compression or CPR. Or if you get to A, B, C, and then you go to a disability, and they've got a GCS that's less than eight, most likely they're not going to be able to handle their airway, and they're going to need intubation. Or you get down to E, and you find that there's a bullet wound entry and exit and it goes right through the area of the liver or spleen, and they're hypotensive, you know that you're gonna to need to push the fluids to keep their blood pressure up, and you're gonna to have to let the, uh, it may decide exactly which way you're gonna go for a trauma center or uh, you know a tertiary trauma center. So adjuncts to the primary survey are things that information that you can get that help you make decisions on what to do. Uh, arterial blood gases you really don't have, but you do have pulse oximeter and end tidal CO2. Uh, you guys generally don't put in urinary or gastric catheters, but you've seen them put in, and we do this in the emergency department, so we know what the urinary output is, so we can follow their blood pressure, and we wanna make sure that no air gets into the stomach so we can help them breathe better. We want to be able to measure the urinary output, and we want to make sure that their heart is behaving properly. So some of these are tools that you're going to use, but these in the total treatment of the patient are adjuncts to the primary survey. In the emergency department, you don't have this luxury. Um, we also might use x-rays. Uh, here's an x-ray of somebody who has a beginning of a pulmonary contusion probably has some fractured ribs that you can see here, and they also have a pneumothorax you can see here. That is something in the primary survey that goes under airway and then and breathing, we put in a chest tube, and then we move on to C, D, and E. And we also take a pelvic film because if there's great trauma and hypotension, then we wanna make sure that we're not dealing with something like this. And we'll go over these x-rays in a few more slides. And then D is transfer to definitive care or um, the after A, B, C, D, E, we always have to start thinking of where am I going? Am I going to take this patient if it's 20 minutes to get to a um, tertiary or a level three care center and it's 25 minutes to get to a level one we might want to take the 25 minute route because then we're going to have surgeons and neurosurgeons and everyone else to help us. And when should the transfer occur? Um, as soon as we have stabilizing measures completed. This is a decision that's made generally by the emergency department physician, but sometimes you'll have protocols that help you make that decision in the field. Uh, again, airway, breathing, circulation control, and hemorrhage control always have to be considered. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about pelvic trauma and or general orthopedic trauma. And your national EMS education standard uh, competencies are gonna make sure that you can recognize and manage open fractures, closed fractures, dislocations and amputations. Uh, those nat same national standards also want you to know about the pathophysiology assessment and management of upper and lower extremity orthopedic trauma, 
Uh, we're not going to talk specifically tonight about upper extremity. Uh, we'll touch on it a little bit. Open fractures, closed fractures, dislocations, and sprains and strains. Uh, also, uh, pelvic fractures are high on the list, as well as amputation and replantation. Compartment syndrome we'll touch on. Uh, we're not going to talk about pediatric fractures tonight. Um, we'll talk very, very briefly about tendon uh, injuries and then lacerations and tendon rupture are also part of your standards uh, that will hit at another time. So musculoskeletal trauma in general are injuries uh, that occur in many patients in blunt trauma. Um, sometimes they're often dramatic and we'll see pictures of their trauma, but they're usually not a cause for immediate threat to life or limb. Uh, and one of the things that's very important to understand as a treating paramedic um, is sometimes these orthopedic uh, traumas are so dramatic that they draw us away from something else going with, on with the patient. Um, and we'll talk about that as well. The very uh, final warning though is pelvic fractures and femur fractures are a very important and often unrecognized source of shock in trauma patients and I'll show you why in a few minutes. Uh, when you talk about uh, injury forces and motions, you have to talk about uh, two distinct types of injuries or force. One is direct force, and that occurs when the force of an impact is too great to be absorbed by the soft tissue, and usually it causes a broken bone. An indirect force occurs when the force is applied to one part of the body and transmitted to a weaker area. Uh, a good uh, example of this is somebody who falls on their buttocks, maybe doesn't fracture a hip or a pelvis, but up the line they get a thoracic compression fracture. Uh, now fractures are breaks. Uh, very often when you're talking to a, a patient you'll say, well, you fractured your arm. And they say, oh, well, I'm glad I didn't break it. <laughs> so you have to kind of gently uh, reel back and, and uh, suppress your laughter and say, no, a break is a break. And it's a break in the continuity of the bone. And it occurs when the amount of force applied to the bone is overcome by the strength of the bone. Now in children and in the elderly, uh, Bones tend to bend more in children, and we'll get those things that we call green stick or torus fractures. And in uh, the elderly, um, sometimes breaks occur a whole lot easier. Uh, very often, the fractures are classified by the direction of the fracture, uh, the number of fractures, and the cortices involved. For example, this first one is a simple transverse fracture. Uh, this is a spiral fracture uh, where the force is maybe uh, and directed such that the bone breaks in a stair stepping pattern. Uh, this is a, a comminuted fracture, meaning there's more than one piece or a displaced comminuted fracture where there's multiple pieces uh, down here distally or up here, or you might get what's called the torus fracture. Sometimes a green stick fracture is also another way of uh, talking about that, where a bone is twisted until it breaks. And lastly, uh, a compression fracture, where force from the top down or from the bottom up causes a compression. One example of this in a younger population is somebody who jumps in the lake and hits the top of their head and they have a, a force down on the neck and they can fracture vertebrae that way. Or the older person we just talked about that fell on the bottom and maybe hit two or three steps on the way down and they have a compression fracture. Uh, 
fractures can also be uh, classified by the type of displacement. A non-displaced fracture is, excuse me, like we just uh, going the wrong way. There we go. Here's a non-displaced fracture. Here's a fracture and here's a fracture, yet the outside lines are relatively um, in line. It's not displaced. A displaced fracture is like this, where the bones are sticking out elsewhere. Overriding or distraction injuries can happen with powerful uh, uh, muscles pulling bones apart. An impacted fracture is like we talked about here in the uh, compression fracture. Uh, avulsion fracture could happen here where you sprain an ankle and the tendon, rather than the tendon rupturing, uh, the tendon pulls a piece of bone with it. And a depression fracture is something like a blunt fracture to the head, maybe a hammer to the head onto a flat bone, such as a skull, that causes the bone to push inward. And that's called the depressed, uh, depressed skull fracture. Fractures can also be classified as open or closed. Um, in the old days, I used to say a compound fracture. Well, open is pretty easy. If there's a break in the skin and there's a bone broken underneath, that's an open fracture. Now, sometimes we can't tell that there's a fracture, but we might see a small puncture in the skin. And very often what will happen, this is obvious that it's an open fracture. But sometimes you'll have a very sharp piece of bone where the bone breaks, it bends. This piece of bone pokes a hole in the skin and then goes back in. And the only thing you have on the outside is a laceration. And then when you take an X-ray and there's a fracture somewhere underneath, that's when you call the orthopedist and you say, by definition, if there's a break in the skin and a break in the bone, it's an open fracture or a closed fracture. Here's an obvious closed, here's an obvious fracture of the ankle. This person probably jumped off a ladder or fell off a, a building and landed on their feet and uh, broke. Uh, this is usually called a trimalleolar fracture where they have a fracture here, they have a fracture here, and in the back of the malleolus or the tibia there's also a fracture, but it's closed because the skin is still intact. What's the difference? This needs to go to an operating room. This can usually be straightened and splinted by the treating emergency physician. What are the signs and symptoms of a fracture? Uh, well, pain close to the site. Obviously, here's a obvious uh, uh, fracture uh, where you have deformity of the bone and then shortening of the bone. You can see this heel is longer than this heel. Uh, swelling is obvious. Uh, they're going to be guarding if you touch on it. It's going to be tender if you touch on it. And when you pick this bone up, chances are if it's broken here, you're going to feel crepitus. That's that crunchy feeling under your skin as you move the bone. And then if there's exposed bone as that, that's pretty obvious. Um, in your primary survey, one of the things that you do is ABC, airway, breathing, C is circulation, and you're gonna have to stop the bleed. These are very popular. Again, it's unfortunate, but the truth, trauma advances when war advances. So when we started seeing IEDs or uh, exploding devices more and more, uh, people were losing limbs that they hadn't since the Second World War when they had landmines. And uh, when we started to see these uh, uh, implemented exploding devices, uh, we started to see more lower extremity trauma and uh, tourniquets came back in style. So you're going to stop the bleeding and also splint the extremity. Now, splinting the extremity uh, has a rationale. Number one, 
uh, it can help prevent further blood loss. Two, it can restore and maintain perfusion. Uh, go back to this ankle. Uh, these toes might start to get cold after an hour or two because now the circulation is not good. So the first thing uh, the emergency department is going to do is trying to restore as much of that normal anatomy as possible. Um, also, by straightening the bone, it relieves the pain, believe it or not. Uh, it might be extremely painful for you to put the splint on, but once it's straight, it feels a whole lot better. And we always tell people that when we put them in a splint, or you know, you'll believe me, you'll feel much better. Um, and it's important during your evaluation, and it's important that you don't delay in the field. If you can split the bone and get it straight, it's best to do it in the field. Uh, in the secondary survey, uh, which we'll touch briefly on, you're going to start looking for other things like paresthesia, other places pain might be, numbness, which these two means that uh, there's probably some type of nerve damage. Uh, you're going to look, listen, and feel to see the extent of the injury. Now, compartment syndrome. What is compartment syndrome? Uh, they're common in fractures of the tibia or lower leg and the forearm, and they happen in very vascular and bony compartments where um, when you took anatomy, they usually would show you what's called a, a transverse section through this. And you'll see in the forearm, for example, or in the lower leg, there are multiple layers of muscle. In between those layers of muscle are blood vessels and nerves and they usually run along the bone. And then there's this tight fascia that keeps the muscles together. When the pressure from a fracture is greater than, and the bleeding associated with the fracture is greater than the pressure it takes to keep an artery open, then you get compartment syndrome. The artery collapses, there's no fresh supply of oxygen, and the artery um, collapses and it closes down. Uh, this can happen in immobilized or tight uh, dressings or casts. In the old days, they used to put casts on in the emergency department. They don't do that anymore because we saw a lot of compartment syndrome. We tend to just splint them in casts that will spread apart over time and uh, keep the bone from moving, but also let the muscles breathe. Uh, you can see it in severe crush injuries. Uh, for example, if somebody gets their uh, forearm caught in some kind of pinion device or underneath a rock or something like that where muscle is broken down and crushed, or you'll see it in burns. And the treatment is done by an orthopedist in the operating room and it's to open up that fascial compartment to let those muscles expand uh, and uh, swell and restore normal arterial and venous supply. The pain is usually disproportionate to the injury. Uh, somebody gets hit with a hammer, for example, and uh, say the force was enough to cause a compartment syndrome simply moving a finger or a passive range of motion of a finger causes extreme agony. And that's when you start to think, is this pain out of proportion to the injury I'm seeing? Uh, these uh, apartments become tense. Uh, they're asymmetric. Obviously this arm is gonna be much larger than the other arm. And they usually have associated numbness or paresthesia because the nerves are also starving. The way that we diagnose this is to stick a needle in this compartment here, and we can measure the pressure. And if it's greater than 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury, then we usually have to call the orthopedist. Some of the pitfalls of orthopedic injuries are altered sensation. Uh, when uh, nerves are damaged, 
compartment syndrome that we just talked about, underlying vascular injury that we don't know or suspect. Uh, crush injuries can lead to increased breakdown products of the muscle in the blood that actually winds up clogging the kidneys. Uh, occult fractures are things that um, we don't see or suspect because uh, we're looking at the big bone sticking out of the leg and uh, that's enough of a distracting injury that the person doesn't realize that they also have a fractured ankle on the opposite side. And coagulation disorders can happen for two reasons. People are taking drugs that keep their blood thin, or uh, if it's multiple trauma, uh, they start to consume their platelets and they can't bleed as well, uh, or they can't clot as well and they begin to bleed. So that's all part of it. All right, so we're gonna uh, leave the general aspect of general orthopedic injuries and we're gonna spend the next half hour on pelvic fractures. Pelvic fractures can totally ruin your day. Um, these are the people who can talk and walk one minute and then die the next. Um, it's associated with other severe injuries, very often uh, ruptured spleens, uh, ruptured liver, bladder, urethral injuries, vascular injuries, uh, and then sometimes uh, aortic rupture. So uh, low blood pressure or hypotension could be a source from the pelvis or other sources. Now, here's a, a, the basic anatomy of the pelvis. Uh, keep in mind that if the pelvic ring is broken, uh, this is a very simple example of a ruptured bladder where a bone fragment from a pelvic injury goes in and causes a ruptured bladder. Now, in this bladder is supposed to be urine, and urine is not supposed to be in the muscles and spilling into the uh, pelvic contents. Uh, usually it's high energy, and these bones are forced into other injuries, uh, other organs, and um, sometimes we don't suspect them. Uh, if there is pelvic injury, however, we have to think that there's multi-system trauma. And what are the multi-systems? All the organs that live in here, and we'll go over those in just a, a moment. So the uh, structures at risk, bladder, urethra, rectum, vagina, the sacral nerve plexus, which we'll go over in a few minutes, and blood vessels, uh, veins in the pelvis. I'll show you a slide about that. And then nerves are also at great risk. Keep in mind that arteries and nerves um, run throughout the pelvis and running along with them generally are nerves in the sacral region, sciatic region, femoral region. So here's a lady who falls, boom, she falls onto her uh, left side and she's got a lateral compression fracture and she injures and you can see bones breaking here and here. Now, some of these people actually can walk around for a day or so but just think of all of the things that is also associated with this. There's blood vessels that run down here. There's blood vessels that run in here. There's a bladder sitting right here. There's nerves that innervate the bladder that are right here. So all of these things are tied together. The sources of the blood loss, unstable pelvic fractures uh, with shock have four potential sources of blood. The bones themselves bleed. And just think of a interosseous needle, right? When we put an IO needle in a bone and inject into that bone, we're essentially directing medicine right into the central circulation. Well, when bones fracture, that blood comes right out. There's a venous and arterial plexus in there. I'll show you in another slide. A lot of nerves and a lot of arteries and veins are in the pelvis. 
and then up to 30 percent uh, of blood can come from other places sources uh, such as the chest abdomen and <clears throat> multiple other extremities so here are the bones of the pelvis these this is the iliac crest you know them as kind of your hips when you put your hands on your hips you're actually putting them on your iliac crest when you sit down in your chair your butt is actually sitting here on your inferior pubic rami when you walk it's your femoral shaft that's walking forward but there's also uh, a, your thoracic uh, and lumbar spine I mean it's your lumbar spine L5 that meets S1 the sacrum here and then the very end of the sacrum is the coccyx here uh, these can break anywhere now keep in mind I'm going to show you this picture and want you to remember that if you break a pelvis it's like breaking a pretzel look at this pretzel i hand it to you and unless it's a soft pretzel from new york or philadelphia you can't break it in one place if i hand you this pretzel and say i want you to break this pretzel in one place it's impossible because you put a force on here, it's going to twist, and it's going to break in another place. Same with the pelvis. If you break here, it's got to break somewhere else, either here or here or here. And very often, very subtly, you'll see it in the sacroiliac joint. So that old joke, you know, where people say, it's my sacroiliac sacroiliac is the sacrum and the iliac bone and very often this joint here can twist and turn and keep in mind there's lots of arteries and nerves so when you break a bone in the pelvis there's always a second bone broken or a significant disruption of another ligament here's the pelvic vascular from the front and from the back You've got your aorta ending, you've got your vena cava ending, and they break into the main femoral arteries and the femoral veins. Each one of them break down again to supply the end of the organs of the pelvis, such as the end of your uh, uh, large bowel, uh, the uh, sex organs, uh, the uh, muscles inside the pelvis, uh, the bones of the pelvis, uh, the bladder, the vagina, or the prostate gland, or the penis, all of these are very, very vascular structures. So when you start breaking bones here, keep in mind that blood's going to follow. Uh, so what's the management of severe pelvic injuries? Uh, and it's an enigma for trauma surgeons, meaning uh, the people I hand off a patient to, because pelvic injuries can range from 2% to 23%, and nearly half of the early deaths um, are from ongoing hemorrhage. Why is that? Because of these vessels. How hard is it to get all the stuff out of the way to get this tiny vessel, which is not that tiny, but it can bleed uh, uh, terribly. Uh, one, this is a gluteal artery, and it comes in back here. And I once just saw somebody stabbed in the in the uh, butt, and they bled to death because we couldn't get anything out of the way, and all that blood was uh, coming out of the pelvis. Uh, anyway, prompt and effective management for pelvic injuries has to be done. A pelvic binder is a lifesaver, and it will buy you time until you get them into the IR unit, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Pelvic binders will actually reduce pelvic volume, and I've got an excellent picture to show you in one of our case histories to show you how that happens. <clears throat> 
Um, it used to be that classification was based on the bleeding risk. Uh, and there were uh, four types of uh, fractures, or three types of fractures, I'm sorry. And any combination would be a fourth type. So usually open book fracture is anterior posterior compression, like head on trauma. Uh, lateral compression, like we saw that lady who fell uh, onto the side. Uh, the pelvic volume is compressed. And hemorrhage is a lot less likely in these. They just tend to break bones, but not always. And vertical shear, uh, that's major instability. These are people who uh, jump off a roof and land on their feet or maybe jump uh, off a, a, a bridge and hit something on the way down. And any combination of these can happen as well. Uh, here's an example of an open book fracture. You can see uh, this wide, uh, this is called a diaphysis. Uh, it's, it's supposed to be uh, pieces of cartilage. And this gap here is probably supposed to be about enough of maybe two quarters together, or maybe a very uh, thick silver dollar. And then if you start looking for the other fracture, you look here and you look here, you look here, you look here, I don't see it. And then as you start to go, you look at here, and there's that sacroiliac joint, and it's probably a little bit wider than it's supposed to be right there. Here's a lateral compression. Here's a lady who fell on her side. Look at all these fractures. Here's a fracture. All right. Here is a fracture. This one's pretty obvious. This one's pretty obvious. This one seems like it's okay. So this patient probably fell onto the right side and then broke. But if you think about it, look at all that blood that can come out of there, there, and there. And here's the vertical shear. Here's the person who jumps off the top of the ladder and lands with their uh, right leg first on a stump and then the left leg straddles and you can see the fracture here. This is an obvious big fracture, and this zipper is probably from something that's so old fashioned, uh, you guys wouldn't know, probably from mast trousers or multi-anti-shock trousers that uh, people don't use anymore. But if you look at this left SI joint, look how wide that is. Uh, there's your second fracture, back to your pretzel. Uh, so when you assess folks, uh, you're going to look at leg length. Is one leg longer than the other? Uh, can you detect motion by grasping the iliac crest? Uh, you're not going to rock. You're going to just grasp and see. Uh, inspect the back. Um, and uh, pay attention to this right here. Look at the flank, the scrotum, the perianal area for bleeding including the urethral meatus. Now, this is something that I find that a lot of paramedics don't do. And I, I sit there and go, hmm, I know you're, you've got a 20-minute ride and maybe their blood pressure is a little low and you're putting in fluid, but why don't you take a look and see where else they might be bleeding? Uh, you don't have to do a pelvic exam with a speculum. I don't expect you to do that, but I do expect you, if you see blood, to figure out where it's coming from. All right, other injuries that can happen with pelvic fractures. Hemorrhage, obviously, is number one. Chest injuries are common. Lung bone fractures, head and abdominal injury, spinous fractures, uh, urethral tears or bladder rupture, and then lumbosacral fractures or pelvis injuries, uh, plexus injuries can also happen. Uh, treatment, whatever works. You got a sheet, put it together. A nice pelvic binder, and we'll go over the SAM2 splint in just a few minutes. Um, again, when you apply a pelvic binder, make sure it's over the trochanters. Don't put them up high. Um, and uh, use this method here uh, where you do the click. Uh, here's a SAM2 splint, second generation now.
and they've got these nice little holes uh, as you pull it it'll go click 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 when you get to the proper compression usually two little teeth will pop out here and here and you know that you're at the right uh, compression ratio and then your uh, pelvic sling is in the right place uh, it should be again over the trochanters not up high and listen for that click and you know that you're applying it in the right way uh, it's a three-step application uh, you're going to try and remove objects from the patient's uh, pants uh, i would suggest again especially if there's any indication of bleeding or fluids cut these pants and look so you know what you're dealing with uh, it could be a large laceration over here or something else uh, you place the black strap through the buckle and you hear the click, you know that you're at the appropriate tension. All right, so now you've delivered them to the hospital. How do we treat them? Um, and the best way to treat some of these people, obviously, other than stabilizing the pelvic uh, fracture, is to use what we call interventional radiology. That's why it's important to know if a certain hospital has an IR team. Usually it's a level one or a level two trauma center that has a vascular surgeon or a radiologist around. Uh, so here I'll briefly walk you through this. Somebody's got a pelvic fracture and hypotension. Somebody puts a catheter in and they can see there's bleeding occurring they then put a coil in, they snake that coil in, they stop the bleeding, they take a quick uh, x-ray to make sure the bleeding's gone, and then they look further downstream to make sure that they still have circulation in the other parts of the muscle. Uh, here's another example of somebody with a fractured pelvis, big arrow sign, uh, they had uh, a vertical shear type and this in particular one shows a left common iliac artery that uh, is bleeding and then they go in and they use a cautery device and stop the bleeding and then they do another picture to make sure that there's circulation further down the line because you don't want to kill the only circulation to that area of the body. All right, this is a, a, a nice paper. It has to do with uh, the 10 commandments of bleeding pelvic fractures. And it's written from a perspective of the emergency department, trauma surgeons, and paramedics. And there's, uh, I'll go over these 10 commandments, some of which you'll never see, but some of them are important. Uh, number one, before A, B, C, D, E, preparedness. Um, and decisions are essential. What that means is this lecture and lectures like it, uh, you have to understand uh, the pelvic anatomy and why they can so quickly change. Uh, don't rock the pelvis back and forth. Um, sometimes log rolling is important because if you look at the video of putting on a pelvic SAM splint, they're gonna talk about log rolling. Um, but minimize movement of the patient if you suspect an unstable pelvic fracture. Um, pelvic binders can be life-saving. The CAT scanner, my neck of the woods, is also the tunnel of death uh, for patients with hemodynamic instability, uh, meaning that if you do too many CAT scans to try and figure out exactly where the bleeding is, uh, they can die on you, so the best treatment is sometimes surgery. Uh, correct application of the pelvic binder at the uh, greater trochanter level, we talked about that, and make sure you have the right type of binder. Massive transfusion, meaning giving blood, is only a temporary measure. You've got to, you can give them all the blood you want, but if you don't stop the leak in the dam, uh, you're going to lose the patient. Early orthopedics uh, early on is to get 
physiology and bone straight as much as possible, but uh, not perfect because you want to make sure the bleeding stopped. Uh, Pre-planned and explicitly documented protocols are important and they will shorten decision making. So you should have in your protocols what to do if you have a, a pelvic fracture. You should also have in your protocols where to go if you think somebody is uh, hypotensive because of a pelvic fracture. Um, Reboa, I'll talk about that in one slide. It can buy you some time before you have the orthopedics go in. That's definitive uh, care by orthopedics. And the best treatment of injury, as always, is prevention. Seat belts, airbags, etc. Here's a Reboa device. Uh, I've never personally used it, but it can be put in by a trauma surgeon if they think they know where a bleed is in the left groin or right groin, it goes in, it blows up, and this can actually clot off uh, temporarily a um, artery. I've never used it. They use it in teaching and trauma centers, but it's just something that you may have heard or you may see in the future. This is an algorithm for mostly for um, trauma surgeons and emergency room physicians on how if the patient is stable they can go to CT to find out what their injuries are. If they're unstable they need to go to the IR suite or surgery or sometimes like I'll talk about in one case where the surgeon works on the abdomen while you've got the uh, radiologist working on the bleeding. Okay, we've got exactly uh, five minutes to get through these case histories. Uh, we'll just start off with an injury at the mountain and a little bit of levity. I can't hear the audio on it. Dr. Eschabach, there's no audio. Uh oh, no audio? I'm sorry. Um, well, I don't know why that happened, but all right, maybe another time. Sorry. Um, the audio essentially was these two guys said, you got to move in with your parents now. And um, the guy said, I just moved out. Um, essentially, uh, having AFLAC to make sure that you don't have to move into your parents' basement. Sorry about that. Um, okay, uh, the reason I show that is this uh, ac injury actually came from the mountain. Uh, somebody who had a deformity of their thigh and pelvis uh, because they uh, were uh, went full speed uh, into a tree. It took about 40 minutes to extricate them by... Uh, the ski patrol and uh, the ski patrol uh, put on a pelvic binder, called ahead uh, for um, helicopter transport because the patient was in severe extremis. Um, when they got to the emergency room uh, and work up in the emergency room, uh, found out that they had a hip fracture and a hematoma of their oblique muscle. Um, here is a x-ray that shows the fracture of the pelvis or the, I'm sorry, the hip. Technically, it's part of the pelvis, but in a young person, isolated, uh, there was a little bit of temporary hypotension in this patient. That's why they suspected a pelvic fracture. And uh, turns out that the hypotension was probably more like a vagal uh, type of effect because the patient was not bleeding anywhere else. Um, and uh, this is another view of that fracture. Um, they suspected maybe a spinous 
uh, injury because they had some numbness and they took spinal precautions. Uh, turns out that the spine was okay. And uh, here is uh, two things. Um, they put immediately on the patient uh, a external fixator um, a splint. You can see the buckle from that. And what you can't see uh, outside here is the uh, pelvic split that they also applied to make sure that the hypotension was not from that. Uh, and there's a lateral view of that fracture. So even though this was not technically a pelvic fracture, uh, the hips are part of the pelvis and uh, Ski Patrol took precautions uh, by putting a pelvic binder on. So orthopedics goes to work and they do what they do, which is they have the most expensive and clean uh, carpentry tools in the, wor in the world. And they put uh, this rod down into the femur. They put this rod into the top of the hip and um, the little bits of bone uh, that were broken off, they um, uh, screwed in place. And we can see that they used wire here this is that comminuted displaced fracture I talked about, so that by the time they're all done, the orthopedist has all the bones in the right place and uh, everything is now um, going to stay stationary. Sometime in the future, uh, they'll make a, what they did is they make a little slit here and a little slit here, and they drill all the way down the bone. Somewhere in the future, they'll take this hardware out so that uh, the, once the bone heals, uh, the bone goes all the way down to just above uh, the knee. And you can see how far down it goes. Uh, you can see that these staples were uh, placed so that they could put the rod in and stabilize it with screws and uh, keep it all together. So that's what the orthopedist does. This is a second history, a 63 year old female uh, in a motor vehicle collision. Uh, actually, uh, her husband was turning and she was on the back of the bike. Uh, she, uh, the, as the bike slid and hit the gravel, uh, she, they were both wearing helmets, but she hit her head so hard she had a loss of consciousness. Her GCS was 14. There was a, a stick embedded in her right shin. Uh, and she complained of diffuse pain in her back and pelvis, and she denies any trouble breathing, uh, but she did have some trouble answering questions. So A, B, C, D, E, uh, the D down to 14. Now, uh, here's what uh, happened. What they did is uh, due to repetitive questions, they also report urinary incontinence. She peed. How did they determine she peed? Well, there was a lot, she was wearing jeans and there was a big puddle of urine in her jeans. And this is where the E was missed. Remember I told you A, B, C, D, E? Well, they assumed it was urinary incontinence. She'll be fine if, uh, you know, she's got a little urine in her pants because she's got a GCS of 14 and she's doing fine. Her initial vitals were fine. They called for the helicopter and the helicopter was going to take 25 minutes to get there. And it was 20 minutes to get her to a level three facility. So they elected to take off. Well, just before she got to the hospital, blood pressure 50 over PAL uh, and tachycardic respirations were also a little bit up. So, Essentially, the ER physician, he went through A, B, C, D, E, just as he did. But when he got to E and expose, um, they cut her pants off and found a very large, uh, what they found was a laceration that extends from the pubis through the labia majora all the way up to a rectum measuring eight centimeters in length. And this is where all the blood was coming from. So she did not urinate her pants. That was blood in her pants. Uh, of course, uh, this is blood work 
you can already see that she's starting to, uh, her hemoglobin, her hematocrit are down about two units already. And that's just a guess. Uh, and then uh, she wound up needing to be intubated because she got worse. Uh, here's her x-ray before intubation. Here it is after intubation. And you can see that her chest looks relatively clear on both sides. I'll show you another picture in a few minutes. And this is her pelvis. Look how wide that is. Now, this gal had a pelvic binder on, but she was still hypotensive. And this picture here is uh, taken on arrival. The emergency room physician uh, took this and then he fitted her with a sheet. And this is the sheet that he used, part of the sheet, and he really torqued that down. So if you look at the volume here, and then the volume here, it's closer, much closer to normal. So he's compressing the pelvis and everything that's bleeding in here, he's compressing together and trying to get this uh, pelvis back together. He did this with a sheet and a whole heck of a lot of muscle. And he, uh, he gets the uh, pelvic binder award of the year by, by doing that. Uh, here is a, a, a uh, x-ray of her lungs not too long after the intubation. You can already see by giving her the amount of blood they wound up giving her that she's getting pulmonary contusions and uh, what's called adult respiratory distress syndrome. And then unfortunately, when she hit her head, this is the big bleed that she hit her head with. Long story short, they took her to the operating room. They had to call in an interventional radiologist. The interventional radiologist stopped the bleeding and they found that none of the major organs were hurt. They shipped her off to the intensive care unit where the uh, essentially advanced directive team had to come in and explain to the family that she was going to die, and she did. Now, what could have done different? Maybe wait that extra five minutes for the helicopter and get her directly to the trauma center. And that E exposure look, don't assume that somebody just wet their pants. Okay, and we're at 8.05. We'll get this, la uh, this last one. Um, all I can tell you is this is a guy who was drinking, uh, going too fast, and he went over a jump and wound up, it wasn't a jump, and he wound up in the middle of a highway and uh, wound up hitting a car at full speed that was full. Uh, he had head injuries. Uh, the binder was placed at the scene, but he had to go in for interventional radiology to save his life. And then later he had external fixation and pelvic repair. So uh, if you have unstable pelvic fractures uh, and hypotension, make sure you get to the right place. All right, uh, sorry I went a little over. Any questions I could answer? All right, Christian Weber asks, Dr. Eschenbach, can we do any damage when we use a pelvic binder on a hip fracture without pelvic involvement? Yeah, well, you're going to know pretty quick uh, pain-wise. These do hurt, um, but you probably won't do, uh, you've got to do the scale. Uh, put the binder on. If they're hypotensive, crank it up. If they're not hypotensive, um, at least have it there in case they get hypotensive. Uh, that's the thing I would say. I mean, if they've got obvious uh, pain directly over the hip and they've got external rotation of the hip and shortening of the hip and you think it's a hip fracture, great. But if they start to get hypotensive like this person did, then put the pelvic binder on and treat the pain with morphine, fentanyl. Okay. Jeanette asks, what would be the treatment for compartment syndrome? Oh, the treatment for compartment syndrome is uh, easy. It's not anything you or I can do. 
The treatment for compartment syndrome is opening up that compartment. Uh, that's where the surgeon goes in. He opens up that compartment and there you go. That's the treatment. So this is compartment syndrome. Ow, I can't feel anything, extreme pain, high pressure, open it up. And they'll leave this open until the swelling goes down. Justin asks, how much time should be spent calculating a GCS in a trauma situation? <laughs> well, again, ABC you can get in 10 seconds. Uh, you're gonna wanna get uh, as much history. Uh, I've often said and have been, uh, uh, you know, looked at sideways by my uh, compadres in the emergency department that everybody in my waiting room has a GCS of 14, but try and do the best you can to figure out, do they remember exactly what happened? Can they, uh, you're gonna have to know a GCS because if it creeps down below eight and they can't, uh, and they start to uh, be able to completely not communicate with you, they're gonna buy a tube pretty soon. So it's important to, to do the best you can to get that GCS as accurate as you can. I examine that patient and I say it's 14. You examine that patient and they, you tell me it's 13. Who cares? I examine that patient and I say it's eight and you tell me it's 14. I do care. So you'll get used to it. Jeanette, the answer to your question was rapid transport for that to compartment syndrome is issue. Rapid safe yes. transport, yes, because you can't alleviate that. Yes, you uh, can't. None of this, none of this you or I can do. This you can suspect. That's the biggest thing that's important. Okay. Any other questions? Michelle asks, dislocated hips usually are rotated inwards while broken are usually rotated laterally. Is that correct? It depends. <laughs> Sometimes uh, ones that they're posteriorly dislocated can be rotated inwards. And sometimes if they're uh, anteriorly dislocated, they can be rotated outward. Uh, the main thing is, ouch, it hurts. And sometimes it takes an x-ray to do that. But on both, there could be shortening. Um, you're usually not going to get crepitus. And dislocated hips are relatively rare in native hips, meaning um, they'll dislocate in somebody who has a lap belt and not a chest belt. That can happen. But the most often when you see a hip dislocate, it's somebody who has an artificial hip, and they should be able to tell you that. Okay. Menachem says, I know this is off topic, but can you quickly go over your choice of pain meds, if any, for a trauma patient with a head injury? Um, wow. Uh, again, uh, a head injury, you worry about swelling, uh, you worry about whether or not they're going to uh, go further down. If they have a head injury and their GCS is 12, 13, 14, go ahead and treat their pain. Be very careful uh, below that level because uh, you know morphine and fentanyl are, are good. Fentanyl's on and off pretty quickly. I would probably go with fentanyl if I were going to treat anybody who has a trauma um, but if, you know, they've got a severe head injury, I'm going to start worrying about uh, depression of their breathing. Okay. And uh, Michelle asks, uh, in follow-up to her question about the breaks versus the uh, dislocation, is it more common in hip for a posterior dislocation? Um, it depends. Uh, I, again, on the nature and the force of the injury, I'd say they're probably more common anterior. Um, posterior dislocations are sometimes hard to see, uh, but uh, most of the time they um, 
will actually dislocate inferiorly, go down, and then go posterior or anterior. So I, I see probably half and half. And again, uh, the treatment for you guys is the same. Get them to the right place and control their pain. Interesting and real quick, my uh, sister, she is uh, 70 now, about a, not quite two years ago, she was working in a uh, food distribution center for the, uh, you know, uh, food bank, and she tripped over a box and fell on a concrete floor. She got back up, went to what she was doing, walked home, went around the house for a couple of days. Uh, she just had bruising, she thought, you know, just from the fall. She went to go get up out of her recliner two days after she fell. And when she went to get up, her she stood up and the hip went the other way. The whole wow. leg separated and she had no pain. So they came and got her and took her and they put in a titanium rod and stuff. I mean, she didn't right. hurt at all. Was she it just, a fracture she walked or a dislocation? Oh, it was a fracture. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. a fracture. And yeah. she had been walking around on it for two days before it finally just completely separated. Yeah, that was um, it. She probably had a nice crack that was seventy five percent of the way through and then just Yeah, and it gets right worse. Way. Yep. They exactly. put in the titanium uh, rod. She went through physical therapy at mass warp speed because they wanted to go on vacation with her daughter and son in law to um, um, New Orleans. And so they left East Texas, left Canton area to drive to New Orleans, stopped in Marshall, Texas to get lunch at a Golden Corral. And she doesn't know what happened. She was just walking along. She doesn't know if she tripped over somebody's feet or if the leg just gave. She doesn't know. She just knows she landed on the floor again. And this time it broke down the leg and across the bottom of the titanium uh, rod. So within a four weeks from the original hip break, she broke her femur. So, yeah, and she's, she still had problems ever since, but it just, neither time, the, the only time she had severe pain was the second time, and the only time she had severe pain that time was when they came to get her, you know, she didn't hurt until they started moving her, and then they put her on a backboard and didn't give yeah. her any pain medicine whatsoever and drove her 40 miles. Oh, gosh. Uh, then, oh, it, she was miserable. So, you know, the pain medicine stuff made me think about that. It's because when she was lying there still, there was nothing and then when they put her on the board, they put her on a board, which was extremely uncomfortable. And then that caused the whole pain thing. And they never gave her anything for pain. And she was just, you know, miserable. So keep that in mind. So throwing that out there. All right. Everybody participate. I know Wayne is over there lurking and he's allowed because he has already way exceeded his chats and MD roundtables. He comes in because he likes to, to be a part of these. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Eschelbach. And I hope you guys, oh, he's still here, though. I hope you guys have a wonderful holiday season. And Dr. Eschelbach, let us know if there's anything we can do for you. Have a great holiday. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Merry good Christmas, night, all. everyone. Happy holidays. Everybody say Merry Christmas. Thank you and good night. Good night.